really believe the Lord is going to continue to do what he's doing because we, we're in this, I want to call it the streams in the south restoration for this church that it says, Lord, turn again our fortunes, our captivity. Like there is a turning again when the Lord decides to turn things around for you. You're going you're gonna to see a big change. Dave had a streams in the south moment. His things were turned again by healing. Or it may, be, it may be God opening up something for you and understanding and wisdom that you never knew and just walking in that. And so we're seeing some things, and I believe the message I have today is something that is going to continue what he said already and that, uh, that we're in this time when God is going to be restoring the worship in a greater way the presence of God in a greater way. Let me tell you, the presence of God in the worship this weekend, last weekend, was just like, Lord, we need more of this. We got to have more of this. We haven't, have, we haven't been having special meetings, so I believe we're going to be having some more. Uh, so we're going to uh, talk about something that kind of fits the theme, too, of prayer for Jerusalem. So the message I have today is beginning at Jerusalem, but I have to tell you that this is all about what God wants to do here. So I feel like I'm speaking as a pastor prophetically to our church because that's what I do. I kind of speak what I hear the Lord saying for you, and I believe it's going to fit what we said before because God is going to increase this church. There are going to be increase of people. There was a season of time when we had some branches broken off, so to speak, some pruning done, and that's okay. God prunes to make you more fruitful. And we know that principle, that sometimes things will get out of your life that you sort of liked, you thought should have been there, and really it was meant to make you more fruitful because you had fruit, but God wants better fruit, bigger fruit, and that's what a farmer cares about with his trees. Okay, so if you're planting a field, you just want fruit. But if you've got yourself a grapevine or a pear tree, by the way, we still may have some pears up there, and they're awesome. You're welcome to them. Um, the, uh, we've got trees. You know, the more, the merrier. And the bigger the pears, yes. Okay? The sweeter the pears, yes. You look for quality, not just quantity. So we're set for increase. Uh, the streams in the south are flowing in a fresh way. But today we're going to start with the book of Acts, and we're going to look in chapter 6 of the book of Acts, because what Jesus did is he commanded the apostles to go into all the world. And he said, now I want you to start at Jerusalem. I want you to begin there in Jerusalem. And, but there was a huge, when he said beginning with Jerusalem, he and Judea and Samaria to the uttermost parts of the earth, which I want you to go to Acts chapter 6, there were phases or shifts that went along the way. And I believe that we're stepping into a shift in our church that I believe fits what happened with Stephen, okay? And where we are in Acts chapter 6. So I'm seeing a comparison with Acts chapter 6, the season that the church was in, and sort of where we're at right now. So I want to start with Acts chapter 6, but then I'm going to show you um, kind of how God took them from a bunch of... 12 Jewish guys, some from Galilee, some from different parts of Judea, and how he took them after the resurrection and how they became the apostles and how the church became an international church. It's just amazing. So we're going to start with Acts chapter 6. Now, verse 1, it says, In these days when he, the disciples were increasing in number, a complaint by the Hellenists, arose against the Hebrews because their widows were being neglected in the daily distribution. And so here we are having an argument, if you will, or a complaint between Hellenists and Hebrews. So you've got these Greek Jews that are, if you will, of the chosen people, yet their culture was also not Jewish. Right? So... Some grew up in, in uh, Turkey, what we know now as Turkey. Some grew up in Asia, Asia Minor. Some grew up in Greece, what we know as Greece. Some grew up in Northern Africa. 
Some grew up in Ethiopia. They were all over the place. That Greek empire was huge. What we know now is Persia. They were uh, everywhere. So it says that there arose a complaint by the Hellenists or the Greeks, the Greek Jews from different parts of the world against the Judean Hebrews, the people that grew up in Israel because their widows were being neglected in the daily distribution. So the first challenge that they really faced up till now, it was like all apostolic victories, you have complaining going on. And it arose because the Greeks were treated like second-class citizens by the Jews and the widows. And so you have issues of, of uh, culture. You have issues of where you grew up. You have issues of tribalism between groups, even in a region. Like you can go to places like, I'm telling you, there, the accent, even the southern accent here shifts depending on where you are. And the southern accent in Martinsville is different from the southern accent in Bassett. And it's different amongst different people, even amongst the blacks and amongst the whites. They have different southern. And I didn't, being musical and I like to listen to stuff like that, I'm hearing differences. That, they may say the exact same word, right, grown up, their whole family for generations. They may say the exact same word differently depending on their skin color. Am I right or am I wrong? Those of you who grew up here know this. Okay, so what happened? They were giving out food every day to everybody because what was happening is all these people from all over the world were staying in Jerusalem in the school of the Spirit. What happened at Pentecost was the beginning of Bible school. You hear what I'm saying? All of these people that God was going to send back home stayed so that they could receive the impartation from the apostles so that when they went back, they had something to give. So those two to 3,000 people that got saved didn't go home. Well, what happened? They ran out of money. So what did they do? People sold property so that they could feed this multitude of people that were going to the temple and getting taught by the apostles every day. Do you hear what I'm saying? So think Bible school right after Pentecost. That's what happened. So these people were not being taken care of, that they were showing discrimination against the Greeks and the widows. And you know that there can be discrimination against women as well. Can somebody say amen to that? Amen. That they favor men. And I've seen it in church. I've seen it that more talented women are passed over for some guy because preachers, and come on, the church culture tends to favor guys. Well, I was raised in that church culture. God's blowing that away in this. I'm telling you, this revival, we're going to see like women preachers and women apostles and women, everything that's going to blow people away. Now, they've been in Pentecostal circles for years. And the Pentecostal people were actually pioneers in women ministry. So, and this church was greatly impacted by some anointed women. And one of our apostles is Sylvia Evans. Anyway, so, first thing we need to learn from this. You ready? Complaints can be open doors for change. Positive thing. The complaints that went on was a good thing. Because what God did is he forced them to deal with what was already there. I would rather have someone tell me what they really think, even if they don't think I'm going to like it. I'd rather hear it than not. As a matter of fact, no complaining is actually a, can be a sign that something is really wrong. Huh? Is that part northern? <laughs> That's my bias from the north, yeah. That, that if people won't tell you what they really think, and then nothing changes, because they don't really care. It's a false sense of peace, because a group is stagnant. A group 
that is stagnant ain't going anywhere. And a train that don't move or a car that don't work, or if you don't drive your car, you won't know if there's anything wrong with it. But when you crank the car and you hear it while you're running it, guess what? Deal with it. But if you never crank your car, how do you know there's something wrong? So this is what God's doing. He was showing up a squeaky wheel in the church, and it needed to be addressed. So, if her, I mean, I used to hear this expression. I used to use it. Dead people don't praise the Lord. It's a scripture, right? Well, it's also true that dead people don't complain. So if you're spiritually dead, you're not going to complain about something because you're not really hungry for something. I want the presence of God. I don't want to be sitting around going through the motions. I don't want dead church. I don't want dead church. God deliver me from dead church. Come on, praise him. I don't want, you know what I'm saying? Like Janine said, I'm not going back to this golf clapping church. I'm not going back to like, we got to have a, got to get somebody to come in to have some light. It ain't going to happen. The, the, the thing is, they dealt with it in a healthy way. And I got to tell you, if you've been in this thing called church for long, there's a difference between a healthy conflict and an unhealthy conflict. And if you've been alive for long, you know there's a difference between a healthy conflict and an unhealthy conflict. There are, there are conflicts that are necessary for growth. Then there are conflicts that, are, that will hurt more than they help. And actually, it was uh, Tom Jones at the conference that he gave a few examples. All right, so first thing starts with, I need, I want, I desire. That's good. That means you have a need that's not being met. The widows were not being fed. The Greek widows were being bypassed because the Palestinian Jews were only thinking about their own kinfolk. All right? But if your need or your desire turns into a demand, then you start getting into that gray area of a healthy conflict to a unhealthy conflict because demands can turn into I judge you now my need is not getting met therefore I'm going to demand something and if you don't give me what I demand I am going to start judging you and calling you stuff that I shouldn't be doing and if judgments aren't addressed then punishment comes next I will start making you pay for not taking care of my need. That's unhealthy conflict. And people will take, they will take, they will punish you, whether they're with their mouth, with their actions. They'll, they'll find ways to punish you and make you pay if their needs aren't being met. So if you have a need, talk about it. Talk about it so it can be addressed. And don't resort to judging or punishing. Another way, another way to look at it has to do with uh, another one has to do with competition. Competition can kill uh, revival, and competition can kill needs being met. If your complaint turns into competition, that means you going from expressing a need to, I will win over you at any cost. Then you're no longer in a place of mutual help. It's either you win and they lose. And you know what people do when they get into that competitive thing? They not only want to see you lose, but they may injure you so you can't play. And some will even want you gone or dead. There are different stages of that. And that's why you're actually seeing it manifest on our political scene. The competition between the political parties, some are even expressing that their opponents die. And it's okay. You notice that there was an outrage over that in our, in our media? Why? It's the carnal mindset of competitiveness. If you die, that's okay. That's one less person I gotta compete with in my ambition.
one thing about it is that if you've got the heart of Jesus, if somebody dies so that you take their position, you're, you weep. You cry. David cried over Saul dying. He didn't rejoice. He didn't want his, you know, Saul made it a competition. David, it wasn't a competition. For David, God either put him in or he didn't. I'm serious. And you see that in the church. Competing. Oh, my goodness. You know, so, you know, and so once you get out of that, I feel like that's, a, that's a one of our values, by the way. It's a value that we have. And I believe we've established that. I can say that about Ronnie. I mean, I just, you know, Jenny. He ain't like that. I know it. Once you realize that it's only God that puts you where you want, to, where he wants you to be, I mean, then you realize, then you give up trying to compete. And, you know, it's not a lose-win. Lose you know, I win, you lose. Okay. So what do we see? What did the 12 do? They summoned the full number of the disciples. I love this. They get everybody. Now think about 12 people and Luke or the Holy Spirit uses the word full number and it means everybody. They got the entire Christian community together to address this issue. That's a characteristic you see in the beginning of the book of Acts. It talks a lot about the full number. Everyone did this. Very it's a huge sense of unity that we don't even, it's hard to even imagine right now, but it's there. So what they do is they get everybody involved in hearing from the Holy Spirit. They say, it is not right that we should give up preaching the word of God to serve tables. So they share their need. This is our need. We need this. What was happening is there were so many people. Siri just heard me. Um, yeah, I said serious or something. Okay, so, so the apostles, what they did is they said, this is what we need. We need to be apostles. We need to do what God's called us to do. What is it? We need to pray and administer the word. We're not waiters, but they've been doing it. Why? Because God had yet to deal with the people who God had chosen for this. But God chose these seven people because that's what the people wanted. So the Holy Spirit moved on the entire group to choose seven men. The apostles said, you choose seven men to do this. And they weren't like saying, you know, we, we're going to do the, you know, we're going to just be the guy sitting in the office, you know, and you're all going to do all the work. It wasn't like that at all. They were preaching every single day in their Bible school, raising up all of these missionaries going back home. They were working themselves to the bone. Now, I believe, guys, that we are at this place. It's time. It's time. God, I believe the Lord put me here. One of the reasons why God put me here is that I can do a whole lot of stuff. I'm not really good at certain things, but I can do a whole lot of things without burning the church down. <laughs> do you see what I'm saying? You may not want me wiring your house, but I wired, I wired my house in Eden, and it's still up, and it didn't burn down. Okay? Got that? I wired Danny's house. I plumbed Danny's house. But I ain't going to quit my day job. Does that make sense? I work with concrete, but I ain't quitting my day job, especially concrete. Okay, have you ever done it? Oh, Lord. Roofing. I've done roofing. I'll never forget doing roofing with Kevin. Kevin Hughes, roofing his house in Eden, North Carolina. Barry Hussey roofed this place. I'll never forget it. Why? Why? My buddy Phil McNeil, he's a pastor and leader upstate New York, was roofing. I sent Phil down here. I said, Phil, come down here to Martinsville before you start your full-time ministry. Barry Hussey will take good care of you. Barry did. What did Phil do? Lay block for this building. <laughs> Roofed the house. Worked in the deck. And one story that Phil told me about Barry was 
when Barry lost his footing on the roof and he fell off the roof. And on his, on his way down, he goes, I hate it when this happens. <laughs> Boom. Why? Was Barry a roofer? No. No, but there are times and seasons when apostolic people do what they have to do. But it doesn't need to stay that way. God is anointing people. He is anointing people to wait on table. And that sounds really bad. The word waiter just doesn't sound really cool. But that's what they say, waiter, servant. Servant's got a bad name in America because of all of our stupid slavery. You know, it's hard to use the biblical terms for slaves because of our history. It's bad. So we Christians have to come up with Greek words like deacon. That way nobody knows what it really means. <laughs> Greeks do. But it means do whatever somebody tells you without questioning. Just do it. Doesn't matter whether it's cleaning the toilet or moving chairs or, or painting or cutting grass or pulling out weeds or kudzu or whatever it is. But it's way more than that. This is what I want you to see. It's, um, because there's a shift in ministry. There's a big shift in ministry. Look what, look what the apostle says. Pick out from among you, pick out from among you seven people of good repute. And look, look, look at the, look at what he's asking. Full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom. That's the word. This word wisdom is not in there until this point. It's all about signs and wonders. It's all about power and miracles. It's all about preaching the word. But now there is an element of wisdom that has to come back to this church that we used to do things in a wise way that multiplied the ministry of the word. We got to have it. I can't do everything. Ronnie can't do everything. Just can't happen. If we're going to grow. It's just not going to happen. So. They need to be full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom. So there's this wisdom that comes. And there's a cool thing about this. I'm going to show you in a second. But we will devote ourselves to prayer and the ministry of the word. I'm just telling you the truth. There came a point in my life where I said, I cannot do everything. I'm just going to do my prayer and time with God, and I don't care what happens here. I know God's going to take care of it. I just had to trust the Lord. And that's part of walking in faith, is trusting God when you can't do everything. Trusting God when you think you don't have the resources, but you do. So certain things happen that God does that you didn't think you could do, because God had a way to do it without you doing it. And I, we can, I can tell you example after example after example how somebody said, I just want to do this for you. Okay, thank you, Jesus. Concrete's done. So there's this the element of wisdom now that needs to be running in our church. We need to up our wisdom level and maintain the power and the signs and wonders level. So God's faithful to do that, isn't he? He is. So we've got the signs and the wonder, but now we need to, to do the wisdom because I'm telling you, the Holy Spirit is telling you right now, there are Greek widows not getting ministered to because of us. Because we're not getting it together. I'm telling you the truth. There are people's needs are not being met. Not within this assembly here. I think it has to do with in the community as well. There are things that we should be doing that we're not doing because of attitudes, cultural differences. Yeah. Okay. All right. Praise God. The most important thing is with wisdom is setting good boundaries. And that's a wise thing to stay within your Try to stay within the boundaries that God makes you good at. 
and that you, you recognize people for their giftings. So that's why I brought Jim and Rosemary Hess in here. That's why I brought them for the Motivational Gift Seminar, because I want you guys to really know who God made you to be. That's it. It's so important that you need to be that way, to be motivated so that you're, that you're doing something you love doing because that's who God made you to be. So that's, that's just something awesome. So that's important. It's, it's right here. It, it says, it says uh, use wisdom. And notice that every single one of the people that the group chose, right, they were all Greeks, Greek names. Every one of those names, Greek names. So they got a bunch of Greek Jews to make sure that the Greek Jews' widows got taken care of. Prochorus, that's Greek. Philip, oh, he was the father of Alexander the Great. Philip the Conqueror, great historical figure. Prochorus, that's a Greek word for the Lord of the, the head of the dance, the leader of the dance and the worship. Great names, Nicanor means overcomer. Nicolaus. And it says here, specifically, whenever the Holy Spirit specifically names a person and a location in detail, pay attention. The last one, Nicolaus, was a proselyte from Antioch. That means he was not born a Jew, and he was from this town called Antioch. Mm. We're going to hear more about Antioch in the book of Acts, aren't we? Got it? So the Holy Spirit is telling you that this gospel is for everybody, including people who were not born Jewish. So you've got Jewish people raised in Judea. Check. Jesus came to them. Now, the Greek people who were not born in Judea never saw Jesus face to face. I hung out with Jesus. What about you? You were living in, oh yes, the backwoods of Turkey. Right? Stephen, maybe never saw Jesus, ever. Right? So it's important to see that the Holy Spirit was equalizing ministry, not based on the flesh. It's what God's doing in your life that matters to me. See what I'm saying? I'm not going to be prejudiced because of your gender or sex. I'm not going to be prejudiced for where you come from. I'm not going to be prejudiced by the way you talk, the way you act, how big or tall or strong or physical, anything. I want to see what God is doing in your life. That's what really matters. Because God's doing something a whole lot bigger than this place. He always has, and he will, and he'll continue to do it. Praise God. So you need to know who God has called you to be. You need to set good boundaries. Um, Hands were laid on them, and they received an impartation. And notice here, when they said in the table waiters, it says, look at verse 7. Because of the deacons, it says, the word of God continued to increase. And the widows were taken care of. And the number of disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem. I believe if we're faithful and do what God says, we will see multiplication, not addition. Amen. We're going to see it. And a great many of the priests became obedient to the faith. So they reached a class of people that were not being reached up to that point because of the Greek revival that was going on. And Stephen was Greek. And here's the thing that we need to understand. A very foundational principle in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, Paul said, the Greeks seek wisdom, Jews go after signs and wonders. Up till this point, wisdom was not mentioned as a factor until we start talking about Greek people. You have to speak to Greek people in their language because some people ha will hear based on their cultural being brought up and what minister to you growing up and what got you on fire for God may not be what will get someone else on fire for God because you don't speak Greek and you don't think like a Greek and you don't act like a Greek. You're just Jew all the way through. Praise God. That rhymes. Praise God. 
You're just Jew through and through. And we don't want to be a church Jew through and through. You know what I'm saying? As a metaphor. We don't want to be such a single, single cultural church that we can't reach people. We got to have some Hellenists out there to raise, you know, Helen. Hellenistic. We got to do some Hellenistic stuff to the devil. And they had to speak the language, which was wisdom. They had to use this supernatural wisdom to get a hold of these people. To, and they were servants. And the word of, but you see, by doing what God says, you multiply the word of God. That's the point. The point is, by waiting on tables, by taking care of widows, by doing signs and wonders, the word of God is multiplied. And look what happened. Stephen, verse 8, full of grace and power. So now we see this deacon, this table waiter, doing exactly what the apostles are doing. This Greek-speaking boy from the hinterlands is getting up there and seeing miracles. Great signs and wonders. Not just signs and wonders, but mega signs and wonders. And then he gets persecuted by his own folk. And that's what happens. You get out there amongst your own folk, and they go after you because you're reaching them. They're fussing at you. And say you're, you're a, say, and this has to do with age, by the way, guys, and generation. Say you're a college age you know, person. Well, we had revival when I was in college. Let me know, let me tell you, I, got, I took some heat from my college buddies because I started preaching at them nonstop. And we saw miracles. But we also got resistance from the folks that we were where we were at. And when I was 20, 20 years old, 17 years old, I mean, I was a different person. I related to a different group of people. I did not go to the old folks' home to preach and stuff like that. They didn't relate to me. But I'll tell you what, the Lord shook the college we were at. And so, so God used us right where we were at with the people that we were being saved with, our generation. Now, i sad to say, guys, I hate to say, honey, we got to accept this. I, we're just not 22 anymore, are we? So we're going to relate in a different way to that age group. We're not going to have the impact that you guys are going to have. I'm just not going to do it. I'm not going to get, reach a 30-something like you. You know exactly you listen to the same jokes. You've seen the same TV shows. I'll crack a joke. Like when I see funny stuff, it's like Jetsons. <laughs> when I look at Batman, it's the TV show, not the movie. Star Wars, Star Trek, What's th and it's the first Star Trek with the guys that wore the red shirts, right? They never made it all the way through. They were the ones that worked in the COVID department. Now, all right, so those kind of jokes are totally lost on some people. They never saw that. They never heard of it. So I can't relate the gospel to them like you can. It's just not going to happen. I mean, the Holy Spirit will do miracles and signs and wonders, but some people need Greek. And I just don't do Greek when it comes to different generational people. So it's very, very important. Stephen's wisdom opened up the door for integration of the gospel and structure, by adding structure, by adding wisdom and some structure, they multiplied revival. And this is what's amazing to me. I counted the verses. In Acts chapter 7, 52 verses is recorded of the, his message, Stephen's message. Can anyone, Tim, can you think of anybody that had more of their preaching recorded in one place in any of the scriptures? I mean, even the Sermon of the Mount is, I mean, that's, that, I, he, yeah, Luke sat there, and it was amazing. Think about it. Peter didn't have his message recorded that long. John didn't have his message recorded that, now these wrote, they wrote the Bible. Yeah, that's, that's okay. So they did what God wanted them to do. But look, look at what the Holy Spirit is trying to tell us. He's trying to say, 
that if you step out into what God has for you, and it may not be an apostleship, but man, God's going to use you. He's going to use you. Yeah, it's a rock concert, Tim. We all been at rock concerts. Huge, huge. He was a teacher, and you ask a teacher a question, and next thing you know, for the next half hour, you just listen. And that's what happened. But Luke got it all. So here's my question for you. We're closing, because I'm being good to you today. You're being good to me. Can you translate your Hebrew into Greek? You know what I'm saying? Can you make your wellspring something in another place? All right? Think about how you can do that and where you do that. For example, I think of Dave in this respect, so allow me to use you as an example. I just don't do games that much. Why? My personality temperament would turn me into a total... I, would, I just would go so crazy over it, I wouldn't be able to be keep boundaries. So, out of safety, I don't put games on my phone. I don't put games on my tablet. Because I see, I don't put a single game on my computer. Never. My laptop. Why? I know who I am, and I, it's like opening up the floodgates. We just want a little water out of fill pad dam, so let's just put a little hole in the dam. Guess what would happen, right? Dam would collapse. So I don't try. I don't try. All right? Now, if you have an anointing for that, God bless you. God bless you. Go for it. Whether it's TV, I mean, whatever it is, whatever it is that you're Greek that enables you to connect with somebody in Martinsville and Henry County or wherever it is, God gave me music. That enables me to go anywhere. And I do music, I do music of all kinds. And that was the other kind of funny thing, because I do classical, but I also do pop. I grew up with the Beatles, but Beethoven, roll over Beethoven, rocking two by two. <laughs> yeah, that's an old song that if you didn't know that song, anybody, how do you know exactly what song I'm referring to? Not everybody, right? <laughs> right, Mary? Who, who did it? Early Beatles album. But it wasn't one of their... It might have been Chuck Berry, too. Yeah. So are you a Hellenist? And you could be the one added to the 11 to make 12 again. There may be an apostle here. That There's always room for, for an apostle. I just think the Holy Spirit was very intentional in Acts chapter 1, saying, we need another apostle. So there's... Always going to be room to add to the 11, but there's the 7. Wide open, buddy. Wide open. Signs and wonders. Serving people. Loving people. Getting stoned. Oh, Tim's gone. Getting stoned. You know what I'm saying? All the stuff that the apostles went through, Stephen went through. Actually, he was the first one. Wasn't Peter the first one killed? They would have wanted all to, you know, they would have wanted that honor, but no. So there's, there are things that God has for us. They both float in the power of the Holy Spirit. So don't think, I just really believe there is something that we're going to be doing. I don't know what it is, but I think there's going to be some way that we're going to reach in the community with food or something like that, that you guys are going to come up with. I just feel like there's going to, because we got people that do food here. And I believe there's going to be outreach with music and worship. But I'm not, I'm sorry, I ain't leaving the word of God and prayer to wait on tables. I'm just telling you, I'm spelling it out. It ain't going to happen. Not this, I've been, I'm, I'm getting, you know, after so many years, you got thinking, oh, you start thinking, counting upward and not counting back. See, when you're a certain age, you think, oh, I'm 20 years from birth, so you count from birth. No, when you get to a certain age, you count from when you think you're going to, you count backwards. It's the truth. There's, some, there's a certain point in time when you count from there, whether it could be retirement, like, am I going to have any money when I'm like, 
See what I'm saying? You got to count backwards. So, well, not spiritually, but you know what I mean. Try to be practical. So, so I'm just not going to do it. So I got to tell you that. I mean, I just I want to do what God called me to do. And you know, I would love to. And I think with Ronnie, the same thing. We got to be doing some music. We got some serious music work to do, and uh, it's got to be done. But there's some outreach, man. There is some signs and wonders that have to happen in the community. There may be, and it doesn't all have to happen here. It doesn't have to happen in the temple. You got to understand, they went out in the Greek community and did what they had to do. But they were one heart and one soul. They were one heart, but they weren't together all the time. So like I heard, we didn't have prayer meeting Tuesday. Why? Us older folks were tired. I was tired because I was up there out of town. People were worn out. So what happens? You guys, right? Am I right? You go over to Dave's house Tuesday night. Is that true? Okay. That's okay. I love that. That's good. And them folks don't want to pray because they're too tired. So I'm just going to go pray at Dave's house. That's the way. You have that attitude. I'm serious. We'll get it together. We can join a gym. Let's join a gym, Ronnie. Well, we'll do something, you know what I mean? But, you know, there, you just have a certain kind of limitation. But you know what I mean? There's, there's a certain kind of limitation, and that's good. Limitations are good. The apostle said, we have got to limit what we're doing. And it's not to be, you know, so you, that's a good thing. Good thing. I've got books I have to write. One of the first words I got on Hazelwood Lane, and those of you that know our church, was from Jim Newman. He said, John, the Lord says, you have to write a book. I haven't done it yet. Why? I've had a whole lot of other stuff to do. Like 40 years ago. Yeah, 40 years ago. I'm not making excuses. But do you see when you're thinking backwards, you're thinking, by golly, I'm going to do what God said he wants me to do. I got to do this thing. I'm sorry. I don't care. I'm going to do it. You know, and God's going to have to raise up a Stephen or a Prochorus. That's a great name. Or whatever, all those Greek names. It's Greek to me. See what I'm saying? And, and then, because there are people out there. There are widows that are not being ministered to. So I, I think I've said my point. I think you got it. I think I don't want to overstay it or overstay my welcome. Are you a Hellenist? Can you translate your Hebrew into Greek? 